It's not what it says. What it says, church, is that God is talking to us, and He clearly says, My time is when I will do things in your life. Your job is to trust me in it. That's what it means. And I look back at my life now, and I see that moment in my life when I said, Okay, God, you're going to do it. It's interesting what happened in the rest of the story here. But i got to tell you, I don't know, and, and young people, you guys listen to me carefully, because if, if you've never run into issues of famine and drought in your life, when you face these kinds of things, and, and, and you're experiencing what's going on, I, I, I'm here to build you up tonight and tell you, you're going to experience them. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Hold on, because it's coming. I don't say that to shake you up or get you worried. I say it because it's life. It's life. My son, when he was very little, had a, had a real strong, and still does, has a real strong opinion about justice in life. And he said to my wife, Brenda, one day, his mama, when he was little, he said, that's not fair. And Brenda's response to him without missing a beat was, get rid of, get, get used to it. Life is not fair. I, I, I will remind you, it was the same little boy who got real mad at his mama one day and shook his finger in his, her face. And he said, I'm not happy with you. <laughs> yeah. and, and Brenda, again, my wife is a mama. She looked back at him without skipping a breath and she said, it's not my job to make you happy. It is my job to teach you to obey. And all the kids said, yes, amen, glory to God. <laughs> no, no. Just check it. Just check it. The story goes on in the word where there were four lepers. I find this amazing as it unfolds because here there are four lepers in verse number three. And they sat at the entrance of the gate and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? They had this conversation with each other. They were dying. They, they uh, were there and they said to themselves, look, we're going to die. I mean, there's no way around it. We're going to die. We're either going to sit here and die or leprosy. You see, they, because they were lepers, they had to have a camp outside of the city. Outside of, of, of the city because they were untouchables. And they said to themselves, we're going to die out here. It's going to be, we're going to die of leprosy or we're going to die of starvation. We're going to die. Or maybe we could go to the camp of the enemy, who, by the way, has all of the food and all of the drink. Isn't it like the enemy sometimes? Just to have it all, you think. And you ain't got nothing. And they went and they thought to themselves, yeah, that's not so bad. Maybe they'll just kill us and we'll be done with it all. Or maybe they'll have pity on us and they'll, they'll give us food and drink. So the Bible says they went to the camp of the enemy, the Syrians. And as they arrived at the camp, they began to notice something very unusual about the camp. It was empty. There was nobody there at the camp. There was no men, no women, and no children at the camp. Only donkeys, cattle, a couple of horses, some lambs and goats tied up, and nothing. No human being was there. The Bible says that as the four lepers approach the camp of the enemy, listen carefully to this. As they came into the camp of the enemy, the Lord caused the sound of a mighty army approaching. And the king of the Syrians heard this sound of four lepers coming. But Pastor Richmond, it was only four lepers, but to them it sounded like an army. And, and look with me there. I love this. I love this. In verse, uh, and he goes on down through to say, and, and this, is the, this is the tremendous part of the whole thing. For the Lord is, in verse 6, he says, the king of Syria now, the enemy. For the Lord has caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great army. So they said to one, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites, the king of the Egyptians, to attack us. Abandon ship, everybody, you know. And he calls out for everybody in the camp to flee the camp. It's an attack. It's an ambush. Everybody, leave. And the Bible says that every man, woman, and boy, and girl in that camp left the encampment. They dropped whatever they were doing, and they took off, and they ran for their lives. Four letters. That's all. I, I, I 
find it amazing that one day there was another sound that filled the room where they were all seated, called the upper room. God caused there a sound of a rushing mighty wind and the army. And the power of the Holy Spirit filled them all. Four lepers. Well, these guys got to the camp. And as the story has it, they were there. And uh, they began to eat. They saw, as they went into the camp, the, the, the tent, the mess tent. They found that they were just getting ready to sit down for supper. And everybody left and left everything sitting there. So they went and started eating all the food. They were in, it, it was incredible. Thanksgiving Day was all over. And they went in and they began to eat and eat and eat until they could eat no more. It was the prelude of Chinese buffets, an old country buffet. <laughs> Glory to God, Pastor Richmond. What was the new China? What? China. China ate. I'm trying to figure that out. <coughs> we ate a China ate buffet. I'm thinking if if it's not going to be a fish fry at the buried supper of the land, it might be a Chinese buffet. Get right. Right. Yeah. Just get it. <laughs> <laughs> they ate and ate until they could eat no more. And they decided to take all the plunder in the, in the booties, it says. They went and buried all the treasures in the sand and came back into the tent and they ate some more. Because after all, when you dig treasures in the desert, you get kind of hungry after a while. So they put all the treasures and came back and ate some more. Well, after they ate enough, the second time around, they said, well, there's more treasures. we got to go back out and bury the rest of the treasures. So they did. They went out and, and did it all. Well, that got them hungry again. They came back to eat the third time. And finally, something knocked some sense into them. And they said, we can't do this. We can't sit here and eat all this food because our families are back home and they're starving. Let's go tell them the good news. We have found food. So they went back to the gates of Samaria. They couldn't be in the city, but they told the, the, the gate on guard. They said to them at the guard there, they said, we found food. They went and awakened the king who was sleeping that night. And they said, listen, we have found food. It was early, early in the morning. And as the king said, uh, don't go, nobody go, it's an ambush. Now it's interesting, the characters of this story, and I want you to stop and think for a moment. The Lord dropped this in my spirit this afternoon. There were characters in this story, and I'm curious tonight which character you can mostly uh, associate yourself with. There was this man on whose arm the king leaned. He was a character that said, you're fool. See, what he said back at the beginning there, in, in verse number 2, he said, look, if the Lord would open, make windows in heaven. I like the NIV translation because it says, if God would open the floodgates of heaven, come on. What this guy says to Elisha, he says, come on, Elisha, get real. Come on. What are you talking about? <laughs> this time tomorrow, everything's going to be... Worth, I mean, that's, that's foolishness. Get a life, Elisha. <laughs> you are a joke. You're the laughing stock of this community, Elisha. You think God's going to supply the needs? Come on, get real. Ever met somebody like that? Oh, you go to what church? No. Oh, oh, brother. I, you go to family. Oh, man. You get that church down in Fort. You go down. Oh, come on. Get real. What is your problem? You think, what? God's going to heal you? Oh, oh, come on. Get real. That's what this guy was like. Sarcastic, sadistic. He had no, no trust in God. I don't believe anybody's in this room tonight who was like that, man, but we've known people who have been like that. I have cousins, family who was like that today. <laughs> then there's the king. He was a good king for a long time. He trusted God for a long time. He listened to Elisha for a long time. But the Bible says the king gave up. He was tired. He was weary in well-doing. He had trusted God for a long time. He had heard the promises of God long enough and God was not answering them. They were dying. They were dying of starvation, dying of uh, 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 lack of water. And he said, no, drought's going to kill him. God's not going to, he's not here anymore. And he turns his back on God. <coughs> Had the king trusted God, when the, 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 the lepers came back, he would have said, let's go. Send the troops. Send the camels. We're going to go pick up all the food. And 
and bring it back. But he didn't say that. He said, no, no, it's a trap. How many people do you know that distrust God just before the miracle is about to happen? They've given up on God. They've said, God, you're not going to answer my prayer. I, I quit. And they take your ball away. <coughs> God, help us. If we give up on God just before the miracle is about to happen. The king says, send out, send out five spies. Let's go <coughs> see if it's an ambush. We'll... They couldn't find five horses to take them. They were in such bad shape. They found two measly <coughs> house prospects to go. And so they sent two horses and soldiers went ahead. They came back and the soldiers said, it is as they have said. Okay. And so they went back and they took everything. They brought it back. They brought all the food back. It was a glorious time. There's more to the story, but... I'm concerned about life. When I see what's happening in Delhi, India today, when I walk the streets of Delhi, when I'm driving the streets of Delhi, and I see <laughs> the millions of people, I struggle to put my heart around. I struggle to say, God, what can I do? How can I make a difference? I said that. But I tell you, church, it's the reality. There is a drought and a famine in India that's unparalleled right now. But it's not just it's happening around the world. It's the reality that we live in. It's the day in which we live, church. The world, I think the world around us, the world, literally the world, is like Samaria was at that moment. You may be sitting here tonight, and you may feel like you're a member of, of Samaria. And you're faced with your own personal family, your own personal drought. Issues of your life are overwhelming you, and you're saying to yourself, Oh God, but it was four lepers, four untouchables, four of these destitute people who said, let's go to the enemy's camp, knock on their doors. Let's take back what the enemy has stolen from us. Four lepers. It seems to me as these four destitutes of society brought the salvation of Israel back to Samaria. It was another group of destitutes that the angel came down one night and said to them, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Do not be afraid of this, this day. Born in Bethlehem is your Savior. Hallelujah. Who got the news? The shepherds. The lowly, dirty, stinky, smelly shepherds. Sheep. Sheep. Not, not, not the kings. Not the religious groups. The lowest of lows, lepers, shepherds, the difference. The next three years after my father passed away, were very trying times for me. I was away at Bible school. The famine in my life began to accelerate rapidly. <clears throat> my mother began to lose her mind. She was addicted to prescription medications. She took sleeping pills to sleep at night. She took uppers to wake her up in the day. There would be three and four days that she would go on a binge and I wouldn't see her because she lay in bed the whole time, knocked out on sleeping pills. I was struggling as a young teenager at 17 trying to get my life together. And I was battling these issues of this famine and this drought in my own life. God had called me to ministry. I had a job to fulfill, a vision to fulfill, a dream that God wanted me to fulfill. And I struggled. You may judge me harshly for this, but I went to Bible school in the fall after my senior year of high school. My pastor, who happens to be the former superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Tom Trask, was my pastor. He said, you were Bible school people. I trusted men like that in my life who gave me that advice to do so, and I did so. <coughs> My mom was in and out of issues. She gained strength and get her life back together again, and then she'd fall apart again. I tried everything we could. The church helped us try to do what they could. Finally, one night, as I was a sophomore in college, 